Welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today we have with us an incredible power chat with Sherry Hashemi from Boeing. Sherry, welcome. Thank you, George. And I know we have another incredible guest, an incredible guest. I'm, not, I'm, going, I'm going to raise sort of the bar here for what we're about to have a conversation on, including AI. But Sherry, I'll allow for you here to make this incredible mm -hmm. introduction. Thank you so much, George. Uh, it is an honor to be able to include David Younger. I met him uh, through Kim Smith 2019-ish, um, um, and I've just been enamored with his company's philosophy and their, the work they're doing, and I'm so excited. David, please join us, um, and if you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Vital and the AI work that you guys are doing. Awesome. Well, firstly, uh, Sherry and George, thank you. It's it's an honor to be with you in IdeaGen. Uh, just some quick background. So over the last 20 years, I've had the privilege of serving in leadership roles for some of the biggest technology and workforce development companies on the planet. And what I've learned is that even in the midst of what we're all experiencing right now, this profound global pandemic and recession, companies are suffocating for lack of talent. And this is particularly true in the area of software engineering and AI. And in the case of AI, the problem isn't getting better. In fact, it's actually increasing exponentially. And that's why I launched Vital. And Vital, we solve the world's most unsolvable problems via superior algorithmic thinking. And according to Gartner, the three biggest barriers to AI and adoption today are skills, data quality, and understanding where to even practically apply it. And if you unpack the, the talent piece of that, uh, here's a quick glimpse into the problem. The compensation of senior engineers at large tech companies like Amazon is now approaching a million dollars a year. It's a well, million dollars, crazy, right? And over half of that is stock. So if you're not a Microsoft or Amazon or Facebook or Google, like how can you possibly compete with that? And, and there's one reason for that problem. It's just basic supply and demand. And if you look at uh, today, there's uh, 40,000 people, if you're being very generous, globally with any AI skills, at least according to LinkedIn. But my uh, PhD friends in Microsoft Research say, David, that's uh, probably overinflated by a factor of 10 because there's probably only a few thousand people in the entire world who can confidently write an AI model versus creating ML from somebody else's library. And if you want real competitive advantage, you've got to be able to create it, right? And so the problem is the current demand, according to Gartner, instead of 40,000, back to that generous figure, is actually 2.3 million. So that's a 50x gap between the supply and demand. And if you look at Microsoft's projections, which they put out at the, during the 2020 crisis, 20 million new data and AI jobs will be created over the next four years. And so... You've got a 500x gap between supply and demand. And I don't think that in the history of workforce, we've ever seen such a dramatic gap. And so that's our mission at Vital. We solve unsolvable problems at scale and an oasis of brilliance where businesses have that kind of million dollar talent at their fingertips. So, so did I hear correctly? You're solving unsolvable problems. I mean, that is just music to our ears at IdeaGen as we help to create awareness and connect the dots to help to achieve those 17 global goals of the United Nations by 2030. David, what are some of the current challenges you're facing with using AI for good? Yeah, great question. Well, George, you heard from Microsoft at the summit and you'll hear more from them in the months ahead about their important work in the areas of health and environment and humanitarian action. And Vital is signed on to the UN Global Compact. And we support the 10 principles of the Compact on human rights and labor and environment and anti-corruption. A lot of folks you know, believe that social change and profits are two diametrically opposed concepts. And I believe we actually need to flip that model on its ear. So well, here are a few examples just to share with you. Uh, we're currently focusing on solutions to key questions like, 
how can we transform learning and skill validation when work from home is the new normal? How do we drive diversity and inclusion in software engineering? How can we help companies become more efficient in their manufacturing and in their supply chains, thereby having a material impact on environmental sustainability as well as profit? How do we make autonomous vehicles and drones safer? And how do we solve these kinds of challenges while respecting privacy and security, which sometimes means dealing in very, very limited data sets? Very complicated challenge when you're talking about AI. And so, and, and then lastly, the thing I'll say is uh, in terms of ethical use of AI, we stand with industry leaders on our vital AI principles, meaning AI systems should treat people fairly, all people, perform reliably and safely, be secure and respect privacy and be accountable and inclusive to empower and engage. So big, big challenges, but uh, that's what gets our team excited and up out of bed every single day. And that's how we can recruit the best in the world. Well, and, and you know, what's incredibly inspiring about what you just described is your, your commitment, your sense of purpose, and ultimately the drive to speak to, with the ability combined with that ability to see around corners, which we defined at our recent dynamic resiliency summit, which is the ability to see around corners because you're willing to partner. You understand you can't do it alone and you have a deep commitment to these global partnerships to help achieve the global goals, as you mentioned, with your commitment to the global compact. And so as we're looking at these unsolvable problems, and issues that Vital is attacking and addressing. What will make them solvable? And I'd love to hear for our global audience, what exactly your approach will be to help make sure that happens. Yeah, great. Well, just to make it practical, uh, we I none of this is my doing. I, I'm incredibly blessed with a team of 190 uh, engineers on our extended team who are among the very best in the world. Uh, most, you know, if you look at that, uh, the number earlier I shared with you, you know, if it's a few thousand people in the world who can write ML models, uh, you know, the majority of those folks are at trillion dollar market cap companies, right? And so the, the rest, maybe the other 10%, 20% are at, you know, big universities and only a few are at uh, other uh, old school industry corporations uh, or you know, the, the, the nonprofit and public sector. And so, uh, you know, most of our team have masters and PhDs in applied math, physics, computer science. Uh, they're solving some of these challenges as we speak. In fact, we have a patent pending around uh, one or two of them that I mentioned earlier. And the work that we're doing includes three of the top 25 largest companies in the world as our partners and customers. And our focus is on three areas. First and foremost, computer vision. Uh, followed by predictive analytics, and lastly, natural language processing. But as you look at the landscape uh, and, you know, start to connect the dots, um, and as you think about the massive problems I mentioned earlier, there's a massive data problem. I call it the data dilemma. On one hand, CEOs are swimming in data. You know, periodically, I get in the call, well, every Every day I'm on calls with CEOs who say, David, don't give me more data. Uh, I'm swimming in it, right? And 73%, I think Satya Nadella said at uh, Inspire a year or a year and a half ago, that 73% of CEOs don't even know where to start with their data. And once you do know where to start, how do you meaningfully access the data? Uh, the collective journey of scraping, collection, sanitization, privacy, security, labeling, modeling, training, retraining, that, that is often a multi-year trip and sometimes results in a dead end. And in the process, companies spend many years and millions of dollars later are coming up empty. But what if there were a way to produce uh, prototypes in weeks or months and not years? Uh, what if there was a way to, to outsmart the data dilemma? Uh, recently, um, a top three global auto manufacturer came to us with a problem. Uh, they needed to recognize images from their hundreds of thousands of long haul trucks uh, across North America. And they needed to detect not only what the image was, <clears throat> but whether there was a problematic anomaly. Now that's a tough problem, <clears throat> but then it got harder. They said, oh, just one more thing. For privacy reasons, 
we actually can't give you the tens of thousands of images that you probably want, or even hundreds of thousands of images. Uh, sheepishly, they said, uh, what could you do with a few dozen? And frankly, I laughed. I thought that was a showstopper. But I went to my engineering team, and they came up with a solution. They said, well, we could create synthetic data. I'm like, synthetic data? That sounds like, you know, hocus pocus. Like, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you, you know, using some proprietary techniques, some, uh, some of our libraries, some creative lighting filtration uh, approaches to reducing glare, applying more glare, uh, they did it. And they were able to actually generate false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives. And they built a working prototype in under 90 days. And frankly, that blew me away. And it blew this company's data science team away to the point where they've now brought us in as part of their design team uh, to lead their design thinking team and taking the best ideas from across the company to produce prototypes at hyperspeed, test them out, learn, scale across a global enterprise. And, and that's a game changer. And it's exciting because it gives people hope that they don't have to spend millions and millions to get to ROI analysis on a viable proof of concept or MVP. And they can actually make it happen uh, in months, not years. You know, speechless, speechless on these projects, and it's and it takes leadership. And and, and what a, a, an esteemed colleague of mine said recently on in an interview, he said, "You know, when you see leadership, and you know when you don't." That's right. And right now, we're seeing your leadership. You're setting the tone. It's not about title; it's about leading. And anyone in an organization can be a leader. And 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 what's remarkable about this is the areas that you're pursuing. It takes that vision, David. It takes the vision and it takes that leadership to be able to believe that you can tackle these problems. Because to your point, even with the data, there's mountains and mountains and mountains of data surrounding us each and every day. And how do you even begin to make sense of it? Like I read an article early today that said something about traffic accidents. Uh, believe it or not, in 2020, according to this article, there was an increase of upwards of 8% in traffic fatality in 2020. It, it flies directly in the face of what we thought would happen, which would be all less people driving, less people on the roads, but yet, yet likely more risk takers and you know speeding and things like that. And so the technology, when we look at that awful, awful thing that's called traffic fatalities, addressing that with all of the technologies available now, hopefully can solve that issue. That's one issue globally, by the way. And so um, what you're describing is music to the ears of individuals across the planet that are working tirelessly to help achieve these global goals of the United Nations. I'm gonna turn it to Sherry. Sherry, you're leading, you're helping to change the world. What is happening with you and, and how do we tie this back into what Vital is doing? Thanks, George. Um, so, David, one of the things that you and I have had chatted about um, over the span of getting to know uh, about Vital and your work, you've talked about some different approaches for hiring because obviously you've got a powerful team, a very talented team, and something that some companies can't say, a very diverse team. Um, you, how how has that been working for you and what are the different approaches you've taken uh, to help bolster Vital's position in being aggressive with talent acquisition? Well, thank you for asking that question, Sherry. Uh, when it comes to innovation, the data are clear. Diverse teams outperform homogenous groups in creative problem solving, period. And more than half of the planet are women. And yet, uh, globally, women represent just 20% of the tech workforce. And that number actually goes way down when you're talking about AI. And this is not only an optics problem, it's a business problem. Uh, Sherry, if, if half your customers are women, then you better have women at the table building products for your customers. It's just basic business sense. And at Vital, because of the unique way we attract and develop our talent, uh, we consistently and measurably have 50% greater gender diversity than other AI firms. About a third of our team are women. Now we have more work to do in that area. Uh, none of us are done, uh, but we believe that inclusive teams build inclusive solutions. And that said, it's 
it's really, really hard. It's uh, frankly, it's like swimming upstream and it, it takes all of us, it takes all of us to recruit and to inspire more women and people of color to get excited about the future of AI and the transformational power of math and science coupled with creativity and curiosity. That is an awesome combo, right? For us at Vital, uh, when we say superior algorithmic thinking, it's both the mathematics and the physics and the data science rigor on the one hand and the curiosity and the creativity on the other on the other hand. And so it's all the things that we've been saying for years about education. And it's truly life changing when you get people into STEM careers and, and it's been proven to uplift not only uh, people in their careers, but entire families and communities in the process. That's fantastic. Uh, and you had also mentioned um, some of the work that you had done in terms of early education um, in certain communities. Do you mind sharing some of that work as well? I think that's fascinating and uh, a model that should be shared um, and adopted by a lot of folks. Sure. Now, well, let me be clear that this is not yet part of our day-to-day -day work, but it's part of our vision at Vital, transform lives through transformed livelihoods. And I've seen it, uh, Sherry, and, and frankly, I was, I was blessed uh, to uh, be at Microsoft for a number of years. And uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Back in 2010, uh, January 2010, uh, I was actually at the uh, BET technology education event in, uh, in London. And I was uh, at the Microsoft booth showcasing some products that our team was, uh, was unveiling and watching in real time as the Haitian earthquake unfolded and millions of people um, lost their homes, um, hundreds of thousands of people uh, were, were killed. And, um, and it, it's, it's one of the greatest tragedies the, the world has ever seen. And it's a tragedy on top of a tragedy because uh, you have some of the poorest people in the world, you had a what's called the Haitian brain drain going on for decades where anyone with the brains and the wherewithal and the resources uh, tried to get out of the country to start a better life for their family. And so when it came down to it, um, we had a situation where um, NGOs were trying to help and they were getting involved in on the ground and trying to provide food and medical supplies and, and, uh, and relief. And uh, nobody could talk to one another because the Wi-Fi networks were all down. Uh, there was a very limited Wi-Fi uh, backbone to begin with. And what little of it was left uh, was eradicated by the earthquake. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, it was said at the time that uh, that technology in a crisis and, and Wi-Fi is as critical as uh, those other elements that are necessary for life. Uh, so we actually created, uh, and, and I was part of a program at NetHope, uh, which is a consortium of the largest uh, 60 or so NGOs in the world, uh, a program called the NetHope Academy, where uh, very, very, very smart young uh, Haitian college students uh, got uh, to participate in a six-month program in IT skills, and they were then hired on uh, for the next six months as full-time interns at NGOs. And they, with the help of the, of the NGOs they were working with and help Microsoft, they were actually able to rebuild an entire uh, nation's infrastructure. And then later that was spent, sent out into the schools and rebuilding uh, 60 schools across Haiti uh, with long-range Wi-Fi, solar power, uh, first-time digital access, teacher training. And uh, a young woman at, uh, at the first school, uh, which was at the epicenter of the earthquake in Leogon, Haiti, I'll never forget, uh, her name was Fabiola. She said, in Haitian Creole, uh, she said, my whole life I've dreamed of being a doctor. And until this day, I didn't, real, I didn't believe my dream uh, would come true. And for the first time today, I believe that it can, it can become real. And, uh, and so that, to me, lit a fire that inspired me to uh, start a number of other enterprises uh, but Vital is a continuation of that. And part of our vision is something called Vital Academy, where we want to create pods and networks of talent uh, across the globe. Uh, and it's, it's going to take, we can't do it alone. Uh, it's going to take partnership uh, with uh, the um, public sector and other private sector partners, uh, folks like USAID and, and uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships. So that's, uh, that's our long-term vision. Uh, but we have uh, we have opportunities to do that across the world, including right here uh, in the U.S. 
what a phenomenal display of your commitment and how to actually put words to actions. And you know, you hear conversations that go on about how do we solve this? What do we do? And to see such an effective means in immediately helping people, that's that's amazing. And I it's inspiring. I'm so happy to to hear that and to know that that is um, the root and the base of, of the good work. Um, thank you so much, David and George. Thank you so much for coming together for this this power chat. You know, David and, and Sherry, it absolutely stuns me on the and just in in the leadership and the focus and the work that's being done at Vital. It's just and the statistics that David you shared earlier were just breathtaking when you think about the transformation the workforce the impact and solving most importantly the unsolvable issues and problems across the planet that is incredible well, I'm just blessed to be uh, surrounded by a lot of people smarter than I am. And uh, it's a, really a gift to have you guys invite us uh, today to have this uh, conversation. Um, I, I just uh, maybe a final thought as we close. I, uh, I I think through, you know, what all of us have gone through over the last, uh, you know, several, uh, the last year, really, we're around, we just passed a year since the start of this crisis. And I'm actually sitting right now in Kirkland, uh, which was the epicenter in the news of the uh, of the uh, coronavirus crisis when it first hit back in uh, February, March of 2020. And I, I'm inspired by uh, the Stockdale paradox, which is a concept Jim Collins introduced in his classic Good to Great, uh, shines a light on a, a man named Admiral James Stockdale. And we, we think a year is a long time in quarantine. Uh, Stockdale was a prisoner of war for seven years. And eventually he made it home. And years later he was asked, how did you survive when others didn't? And he said, it's, it's really two things. It's uh, first, confront the brutal facts. And second, hold on to the faith that you'll prevail in the end. And I think as all of us, as we look at the single biggest problem staring at us, um, it's, uh, th those are important words to remember, uh, that we can't ignore uh, what's happening around us and recognize with empathy that our teams are, are struggling. And there's people who aren't on our teams who are struggling because they can't find work. You know, you look at Best Buy and Fry's and the announcements that were just made, it's uh, it's difficult. Um, and so but but it's it's holding on to that faith and that hope and inspiring others. That's that's the thing that gets me going every day. Incredible, incredible. And so how do folks and how can folks find out more across the planet about your work at Vital, David? Great. Well, vital.io uh, is our website and uh, you can find us on LinkedIn as well. Uh, it's just a. Uh, been an exciting time for us as we're, uh, we're young but hungry and uh, and excited to solve uh, the unsolvable problems around the planet. Incredible, and it's vital. V a i t a l. The AI. AI. We put the AI in vital. That's you right. Love I love it. His AI is it should be in everything. Thank you so much for the inspiration. Thank you for your leadership, and thank you both, Sherry and David, for all you're doing to change the world at Boeing and at Vital because it's vital to do so. I have to say that. Thank I you love it. so much. Idea sure. Thank you. Thank you.